Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Annika Romain. I'm John Pratt. What a pleasure to have musician Sam Andrews with us in the gallery today as well. We're excited to be joining you today for a drawing workshop inspired by Grace Cossington Smith's amazing sketchbooks and drawings, and how lucky we are to be surrounded by so much of her work here in the gallery. First, we'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Cambri, Canberra region. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future, and I extend that recognition and respect to any First Nations people joining us today. I'm especially grateful that here at the National Gallery we have the opportunity to appreciate and to celebrate countless generations of cultural practice and artistic innovation through the, the diverse work of First Nations artists. John and I are both practicing artists and drawing is fundamental to our work. So it's particularly special today to be connecting with hundreds of you um, across Australia and to be focusing our collective attention on the process of drawing. Before we get started, I just want to remind you of the suggested materials that we're going to be using this afternoon. We're going to be using about 10 pieces of paper or a sketchbook, some graphite pencils, and we've got some colored pencils in the second half. You only need the basic colors. For me, I'm using yellow, orange, red, blue, and purple. In the first half of the session, we're going to be taking our cue from Grace's sketchbooks and drawing a pair of boots. We encourage you to join in and grab any pair of shoes that you might have on hand. Around halfway through, we'll take a five minute break. And when we come back, we'll be drawing a chair draped with a white shirt. Though you could use any piece of clothing or fabric that you might have on hand. And don't worry if you don't have those particular objects nearby. You can apply the same drawing activities and exercises to any everyday objects that catch your eye. Throughout the next hour and a half, please feel free to submit any questions you might have via Slido, and we'll do our best to get to them. Now let's hear a brief introduction from Deborah Hart, who's the head curator of Australian art, and I know she has some valuable insights to share about Grace Cossington Smith and her approach to drawing. Hello and welcome to Making It Modern, an exhibition that's part of the gallery's Know My Name Gender Equity Initiative that celebrates women artists. My name is Deborah Hart and I'm the head curator of Australian art and it's my great pleasure to be here with you for this drawing workshop which I hope you're really going to enjoy. We're in a room that's dedicated to the work of Grace Cossington Smith, an artist who I dare to say is one of my favorites, probably not supposed to have favorites, but I've had a long connection with her work. And in this room, we have a display of some of her sketchbooks. We've got a really large collection of her drawing books, and they start from her earliest years and go right through to the 1950s. Grace Cossington Smith's practice was really grounded in drawing. So when we have a look at some of these, there are very detailed drawings, as well as some that are quite loose. And what she was focusing on was everyday life that surrounded her. Grace drew from her school days, and for the first few years of her formal training, she really only drew. And I'm going to read you a couple of her quotes, because of course it's always so nice to have the artist's voice. And what she said is, I drew from my earliest years, and I always wanted to draw what I saw. I didn't begin to paint till I was quite grown up, because I was so keen on drawing. Let's have a look at some of them. Grace was interested in drawing the ordinary everyday world, things around her in her home and her garden. You know, she was interested in color, in color sketches, like little, little notations, just using colored pencils. She also sometimes just used a pencil to draw, for example, an old pair of boots, things that she would go out and work in. It's a fantastic, careful study that was partly inspired by the artist Vincent van Gogh. She also was interested in architecture. Sometimes just even if we can call it architecture, the architecture of a room and a cupboard within a room, or for example, a drawing of the inside and outside. There's one that is a sketch of a cottage. It's actually church cottage barrel and it's a study of light and shadow. Not all her drawings were quite so detailed, but it gives us a sense of how she was experimenting and exploring. 
She was very close to her family, and a number of the drawings are actually of family members. And to give you a sense of just how important drawing was to her, she actually gave one of her sketchbooks to her dad as a present when she was just 19 years old. Not all of Grace's drawings were quite so tight or detailed. Sometimes she was really experimental. She tried different things. She was quite adventurous. So now it's time for you to start your own drawing adventure. And I'd like to hand you over to John and Annika, who are going to start you off. I really hope you enjoy. Wow, that was wonderful to see how many different approaches um, to drawing and um, colour that Grace experimented with throughout her sketchbooks. Yeah, those uh, long extended tonal drawings were just so subtle and mm. full of sensitivity. Mm. Um, they epitomise what I think we can define as the slow look, which is another way of defining drawing, to look critically at the world and not to take anything for granted. By way of contrast, we're now going to undertake a series of gesture drawings, which are, by way of contrast, as I say, uh, playful and exploratory. Um, they're a way of defining, discerning the underlying structural and spatial integrity of the arrangement that we're looking at, in this case, a pair of boots. And if I can take life drawing or figure drawing as an analogy. Um, we very rarely start off by drawing the figure by starting off with a toe or a finger or an earlobe. It's making um, strong directional marks right through the figure. Um, we're looking at the unified directional flow through the figure. And it's from those first um, critical lines that we can then uh, start to add the, the parts of the figure to that. And in the same way, um, with the, the arrangement that we have, the still life arrangement, we're going to be making a series of incorporative unifying marks right through the, um, our response. They're also going to be quite quick. Um, they're very brief drawings, and they'll tend to galvanise and hone our eye-hand coordination. I think with these drawings too, there's a sense you can allow your hand to, it has a, a certain kind of haptic awareness of what these boots are about. And so give them some license in when you are undertaking the drawing. Mm -hmm. There'll be two minutes in passageway and um, we'll- We'll do three, three of them basically three of them. in a row. Yep. So three two minute drawings. drawings, great chance to warm up and get our eyes and hands familiar with this this object and wonderful to see how, you know, that, that energy of the, the quick drawings really brings life um, to those static objects that exactly. we're drawing. And that vitality will also be uh, uh, evident when we do the longer drawing too. So I think that that initial starting point is really critical to the vitality of mm. the subsequent drawing. Yeah. Um, so and we'll move the arrangement, the still life arrangement from uh, each gesture drawing. So at the end of two minutes we'll move and we'll be doing another response uh, analysis of what we've got in front of us. Okay. Yeah, so exploring some different perspectives. We yeah. might get started um, and we'll give you a timer so you can join us. Um, just keeping uh, looking at those overall shapes and not getting too caught up in the details for now. Okay. Let's get into it.
Okay, that's already two minutes. John, okay. how did you go? Um, loosely, <laughs> yeah. I think. Um, it takes a while to get into it, doesn't it? It sure so does. So let's, let's try moving these, these boots um, to a different... What do we think? It's kind of interesting. Yeah. The important thing. I like, think I need a bigger piece of paper after that, with all that, that energy. Okay, so second two minutes is is starting now. Just taking, um, you know, what you discovered, what you learnt from that first um, try, and see how we can keep developing it in the next one. All right, that's another one. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> that was really interesting, thinking about the relationship of those two, two shoes together. Um, they start to take on an interesting life yes. of their own. But also just the difference in mark making. You're mm. much more firmer and more definitive than my tens, my lines tend to wander. Yeah, yeah that's and what I love about drawing though, isn't it? That everyone has, everyone you know, has their own aesthetic. kind of vocabulary. Yeah. But I think for me, having to commit um, to that line and not worrying about if it's exactly correct, um, just putting down that confident line is, is important for that kind of yeah. drawing. Okay, so let's have our last two minutes and I think this time John can rearrange the boots. I did, I did really yeah. like stretching out on that slightly larger piece of paper, I think, that time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the final two-minute gesture drawing is starting now. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm.
that was fun, John. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> a bit intense, but a lot of fun. I think the important thing about the gesture drawing is the, that the line itself, there's a whole series of kind of exploratory directional shifts that are um, kind of explored in the gesture drawing, and there's going to be um, a certain distillation that comes with the, the longer uh, mm. engagement with that with the drawing. So it's important um, mm. to yeah. Uh, yeah, work with that. Yeah, sort of nice to take a chance to quickly look back on how how you've progressed from the uh, over the course of those yeah. three drawings. Um, that was sort of where I ended up with the last one. But nice to take a change of pace with the next exercise too. Yes, absolutely. Um, so research has uh, revealed that when we do an observational drawing, that often up to 70% of the time is actually involved in looking at the drawing rather than what we're responding to. And so with this next drawing, what we're going to be doing is shifting that ratio um, of engagement totally to just looking and the drawn mark is going to record or document the acuity of our observation. Um, it's called a blind contour drawing and so what we're going to be doing this time is take a clean sheet of paper and concentrating on a particular contour or edge on our still life um, and when we feel as though we've actually kind of concentrated on that point, we're going to let our eyes travel along that edge and not looking at the paper at all, but looking totally at the object. We're going to travel along that edge and at the same time, the pencil is going to record the experience of looking. And we're going to be doing this drawing for three minutes. Okay. And what I'd encourage you to do is to just look slowly. Okay. So it may be that you only cover 20 or 30 centimeters along the edge. Um, you could be quite um, impulsive too in terms of the way the edge might coincide with certain other kind of contours or other um, elements within the, the still life arrangement. So, the actual kind of intent um, of your line or your looking, I should say, um, is, as I say, can be quite eccentric and impulsive. So the important thing is though that you're looking totally sensitively at that edge and where it's taking you, okay? Um, so take a clean sheet of paper and when you're actually on that point and you are starting to walk that edge, then the pencil can start to record your alignment and experience of that edge. So okay. if, if you'd like to join in now, we'll, we'll start the, the three minutes and just, you can start wherever your eye naturally falls on that object. Yeah. Such an interesting exercise where I feel like my hand on the paper is aligning with my eye moving across the edge of yeah. the boot. There's a very different quality of mark that emerges from this experience as well. Caught myself peeking just then. <laughs> it's a little bit like also that Paul Clay idea of taking the line for a walk. So the sense of control is given to the hand. Yeah, certainly quite meditative and if you can, you know, restrain yourself from looking, it'll be a wonderful surprise to see what the drawing looks like at the exactly. end. Exactly.
Sometimes music's definitely helping me get in the zone for this one. Yes. An interesting exercise how it um, takes you away from just drawing an outline of the shoe yep. but how you start to sort of connect and travel across from the edge of a lace to the stitching to the you know the shadow that might or the uh, yeah the contour like in a on a mountain ridge yeah. across to the edge. It does become a topography of the sorts doesn't it? Mm. Also the physicality of the object becomes quite critical in terms of informing the type of mark that you're making. Mm. <clears throat> All right, that is three minutes. <gasps> it went by pretty quickly. Oh, yes. wow. That's, yeah, I like this. This is kind of more <laughs> exciting than um, the first one. It's just yes. by taking some element of control away. I was a little bit more, um, eccentric I think and wayward well, you, in my line. And you were really slow like yeah. <laughs> um, just use moving the line kind of incrementally yeah. whereas mine seems to be kind of really wandering around <laughs> but yeah it was a, yeah certainly encouraged a different way of yeah, looking yeah. and different sensibility. Different yeah sense of the of, yeah what the, the shoe is about what the boot is about. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah so we've been Getting to know these shoes quite well yes. <laughs> now and thinking back to those amazing sketches that Grace Cossington Smith um, did of, of boots that were um, looking more at light and tone and we thought we'd challenge ourselves to do something in that realm and I think we're going to bring some images up on screen for you so you can have a look at those drawings of Grace that inspired us so much. So thinking about her work, um, you know, she often used quite loose hatching or you yep. know, parallel lines in different densities mm. to start breaking down areas of, of light and shade. Mm. And I think it's always important to remember as well, you know, the cast shadows that are created by those objects as well as the, the reflected light bouncing back from the table, yeah. all of those different qualities of light. You may want to think about also the direction whether the, you have uh, a single source of light in uh, your still life arrangement or whether there's multiple light sources um, because they will all determine the way the car shadow works as well as the way the light informs um, the structure and uh, form of the, the um, object itself. Mm. I think the challenge when we were thinking about this one is that the boots themselves are so dark. So just remembering that you don't have to use the graphite to color in and necessarily get that dark brown of the boots, but you can leave the white of your paper as the, the highlight. Say so yeah. if you look at where is the brightest light shining on those boots at the moment, I see it there right on the, on the toe. So I might kind of start by shading around that area. Yeah, it's also probably important to when you're doing the tonal drawing to discern the light against the dark areas and sometimes um, closing one eye will help to clarify um, how the light is falling and give you an overall summary of the way the light is falling on the still life arrangement. Um, and when you're starting to um, define the tonal areas, probably start off with the lighter tones to begin with and then start to um, increase that tonal intensity as the drawing progresses rather mm. than starting out with the very dark tones. Yeah, so we're going to have a bit more of a slower focused 15 minutes to spend together on this one. I've seen a question come in which is interesting in terms of just asking do we draw in one, one go without 
looking or do we stop and look and draw again? Mm. So we can certainly learn from that last exercise with the blind drawing, mm. even though this time for the 15 minutes we are allowed to look at our paper, yeah. still remember that you want to spend even more time looking back at those shoes. Yeah, um, yeah not to forget about I think looking at the object itself. Yeah, that's critical. I think that as the drawing progresses that you keep giving an account of the comparison between what you're drawing from and what the drawing is uh, starting to communicate. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so let's start the timer and we'll really have a chance to develop this one a little bit further. Yeah. So you might start with that foundation of the sort of light gesture drawing to give yourself um, the general composition and the, and the shapes and then see if you can work it up into something that describes the way that the light is hitting the object. many different shoes we we have you know currently being drawn <laughs> yeah. around Australia <laughs> Sometimes it's important also to leave the paper tone as a way of defining the highlights mm. in the drawing. <clears throat> yeah, and I've been thinking, you know, what we really appreciated looking at in some of those um, sketchbooks that Grace had, like particularly um, the architectural ones where she was on the veranda and um, she was doing her hatching or her parallel lines 
in yeah. a particular direction that sort of emphasized the flow of that space. I'm trying to think with these more curved lines of the boots, you know, how I can emphasize that through the direction of my shading. Yeah. There's a whole expressiveness and presence that's delivered by that uh, mode of registering the, the tonal values there. Mm. One of my favorite parts is this sort of more casual in, interplay of the, of the laces, the sort of untidy yeah. laces there. White anarchy. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, so about ten minutes to go on this one. Yeah. That makes me feel better. <laughs> me too. Often, too, the contrast, the tonal contrast in the foreground is a way of delivering a, a spatial cue, too, but, mm. um, yeah, the higher contrast, the more the, cl the clarity of the, de the defined um, tone in the foreground, yeah, it can be really a great indicator. Yeah, certainly your eye sort of gets drawn to the area of higher contrast if you're wanting to try to create a focal point. Yeah. Or to have, I'm trying to get a lace just sitting in front of the shadow of that boot. <laughs> and then remembering as well as the, uh, the hatching that you can kind of create some areas of um, articulation through the pressure of the pencil, um, yeah. maybe some thicker line work where there's darker areas of definition. For me that's on the, the tread of the boot. <sighs>
of a continual process of reassessment this one <laughs> yes. about you know just look, I had the gesture drawing underneath but then as I'm going sort of looking at the relationships of each shape in relation to each other to yeah. try to get that sense of uh, the proportion. I also found I've rather than I should have a much more oblique perspective here and um, yeah yeah, require some radical reassessment. Mm, we've definitely got very different um, perspectives this time yeah. from where we're sitting. Um, one of the participants has asked, how often do we both draw? Every day. <laughs> yeah, pretty much every day, I would say. Whether that means drawing with a pencil or drawing with a paintbrush or... Um, but making yeah. art is, a, is definitely a daily practice and a yeah, great routine um, that kind of anchors my life. Yeah. I think drawing is... Um, the broad underpinning to creative practice. Remember someone defining drawing as three elements, intent, materials, and movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, the materials can be you know, anything from dust, um, yeah, to the most refined kind of graphite mm -hmm. pencil through to uh, cigarette smoke. I've yeah. seen used as a as a, um, an expressive tool and um, so yeah there are a number of um, I think drawing is has the broadest kind of application in terms of creative practice mm. yeah it's exciting to see the the approaches to drawing in contemporary art practice and I think like in our sketchbooks too mine has certainly um, changed across across time from yeah particularly when I was at, at university this kind of drawing of just drawing everyday objects whether it was a glass of water at the cafe or filling in time in waiting rooms it just was very valuable for honing um, my observational skills and now I use it probably more to connect with particular places so if I'm out in the landscape and really wanting to embed memories and form a lasting connection to that place yeah camera is so instant in terms of the way it visually records a particular location or experience. Mm. Drawing incorporates a much longer time frame mm. and uh, yeah, delivers a very different kind of take on the situation. So we're in our last minute oh. of this extended drawing. I think, you know, I can see, you know, I've barely even got to the second boot, but maybe I might just suggest it, you know, more yeah. likely, li lightly. Um, perhaps some of you have well, just focused on a, on a detail <laughs> um, rather than having to worry about getting to every section of the object. probably going to use the last minute I think to reinforce some of those darkest shadows to try to bring a little bit more contrast also want to say that erasure 
can also be a super, um, an incredibly a critical part of drawing, um, whereas often it's seen as a failure. Mm. I do think, uh, yeah, erasure is a really critical part of distilling, discerning um, mm. how you want the, the drawing to evolve or emerge. Yeah, it can be a drawing tool. Absolute, absolutely. If you use it with the right intention. Mm. Fantastic. So that's 15 minutes. <sighs> it's great to just lose yourself in, in the drawing for a little yeah. while. Yeah. And I think, you know, looking back at the object, I can see that there's elements where I've sort of veered from, from reality, mm. but it certainly um, has been a good challenge for thinking about yeah. light and dark. To quote, and there, there's quite different kind of responses in terms of, mm. or quite a different kind of, uh, certainly mark making, but also uh, mm. perspective on the, on the boot too. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so whatever you've come up with, I hope that you enjoyed the process and, and the journey yeah. of, of spending that, that focused time and attention. Mm. You know, I think it's, it's such an in interesting way of honoring these everyday um, objects. Yeah. Yeah. There's a Any rich history, I think, of taking the, you know, the domestic objects and valorizing them in some way. I mean, mm -hmm. um, certainly the Dutch still like paintings. Uh, mm. painters. Oh, I can see, yeah. yeah. A couple more questions coming through as well. What do we do with sketches such as these? Do we keep them? Of course. Mm. Yeah. I have plan drawers full of yeah. life drawings and other drawings. I mean, maybe some of them um, become nowadays more like less precious to me, which is, a, I mean that in, a, in the best way of like not being too um, tight about them that I can, you know, I could work over yeah. this in another layer, I could work on the other side. Um, but my favorite ones I, I tend to keep and to archive. Yep. Yeah. I think sometimes the drawing process um, also records thinking and the way um, an idea can evol evolve. Um, mm -hmm. And drawing is that hardcore um, kind of indication of, I mean, we talk about erasure as certainly a, a kind of a significant part of that. Um, but yeah, I think keeping drawings, sketchbooks, mm. they're fascinating when you look back on them. Um, yeah, I think that's where I like using a sketchbook as well. That certainly makes it an easier way to keep your drawings um, compared to a you know, yep. spare piece of paper. Like I yeah. can, you know, look back on these things and just think, think about like particular periods of, of my life and, yeah. you know, see how, you know, how oh, I was wonderful. seeing, yeah, how, yeah. I, how I was thinking at that time. Yeah, and then there's another question. When people talk about sketching, do we draw in detail or just an outline or are there no particular boundaries or limitations? I, I would say there are no particular boundaries. I think that mm. you can, um, depending on the, um, the realization that you're um, trying to evolve, then, you know, line, it may be a particular a, a view or experience which has highly defined um, contours to it. And so line may be the appropriate uh, mark maker mm. to use in that instance. Um, but it may be atmosphere and a tonal response may be the, the approach that's um, evoked. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I personally love this, this quote that I heard recently from contemporary artist Nick Plowman who said, drawing gives you everywhere to run and nowhere to hide. So, yeah. you know, the opportunities are really endless. It's great yeah. to be able to see, you know, the bones of your yeah. mark making right there on the paper, but yeah. for everyone to just, you know, if you find the boundary, try to push it, try to find your own approach. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to bring us to our break now. So you've got five minutes if you'd like to go and get a cup of tea, a glass of water. If you can have a look around your space for a chair and a piece of fabric, that would be fantastic. Or otherwise, if there's an object um, that you're drawn to that you want to spend some time exploring with colored pencils, that's what we're going to be doing after the break.
Welcome back. I hope that you feel warmed up after those exercises in drawing that you've just undertaken. Don't feel disheartened if your first attempts weren't exactly what you wanted. You know, I've um, tried my hand at drawing as well, and sometimes you have all these ideas in your head, but then realising it on the page is quite difficult. And Grace herself said this, and again, I want to bring you her voice, because what she said was that sometimes she really struggled as well. She said, you don't have to be too drastic with yourself. You must admit when you're having a difficult time and when all that worry has passed, you might have actually expressed something in a different way than what you wanted. And that might be just as good as what you didn't get. So really keep that in mind. Grace often used coloured pencil in drawing and we have a wonderful example in the exhibition of her favourite sister, Diddy. Her real name was Charlotte, but she always liked to have nicknames for her siblings. And this is just a really beautiful drawing. And she's using parallel lines and she's building up the surface. And what she's achieving here is light in her colour. She always said that she didn't want her colour to be flat and all the same. So she kind of breaks up the surface and she gets this effect of colour radiant with light, which is something she always aimed for. Grace said about light and colour, I'm always so anxious to get the feeling of penetrating light. Nothing to me is solid colour. There must always be light within it. You know, Grace was very interested in colour theory. She read a book by Beatrice Owen called The New Science of Colour that was published in 1916. And the thing that's so interesting about that, like the writings of Van Gogh, is it's really not just colour as you see it, but it's also about how colour makes you feel. So, you know, it's this idea when Van Gogh painted his bedroom that colour could be emotive. It could be about, you know, not what you see, but this vibrant kind of warm colour or a cool colour, depending on your mood. And the same with Beatrice Owen's writing. She was thinking about the meditative aspects of colour. That colour can also be quite a healing thing, it can have healing properties. So just think about that as you experiment. You know, it's drawing is such an adventure and I really hope you enjoy the second part. So I'm going to say goodbye now and hand you over to John and Annika and thanks so much for being with us today for this adventure into drawing. All right. So that was great to hear about some of the use of colour um, that Deborah was introducing us to in terms of Grace's work. And I mm -hmm. think it has that amazing link from the early black and white sketches and her interest in light that she then wanted to mm -hmm. be able to have the feeling of light emanating through the colour in her paintings. I think looking at the paintings here too, uh, the, the rooms, the, the interiors seem there's an illuminating light that seems to um, yeah, really absorb the whole and deliver a, a really strong uh, atmosphere. It was fantastic. Mm. It was beautiful looking through some of the sketchbooks as well mm. and seeing how she often lays yellow down um, as a starting point, which is one of those colours that seems to glow through. Mm. We've got the white paper um, bouncing off with the light reflecting back mm. and then building up, slowly moving from the lighter colours, the yellow, through to the more definite, um, darker colours like the blues and purples that start mm. to bring proportion and, and contrast. Yeah. Also, I think, yeah, that it's not only delivering um, atmosphere, light, it's also structurally important too to have that colour there as a mm -hmm. way of um, defining the various planes in a lot of the objects that she works with. <clears throat> yeah, so we're going to have a go at working okay. with colour in a more sustained drawing in this second half um, of our workshop. And like I mentioned before, I didn't um, choose to use very many colours. Mm. We've got a white shirt hanging off a brown chair, but mm. I'm going to take my cue from Grace Cossington Smith and being a little bit more playful, um, experimental with the relationships and the way of layering the colours. Um, so thinking about how colour can be emotive, you know, it can relay sort of energy and excitement like we see mm. in so many of her works. And I wanted to kind of correlate the use of yellow with the gesture drawings that we were doing before. 
Um, and so you may uh, like to, in this in the initial part of the drawing, use yellow as a way of, as an exploratory um, medium and to just start to define or evolve a composition just using the yellow. It's uh, not too definitive in yeah. terms of its, um, its uh, yeah, yeah, color. I think, yeah. like we mentioned before, that process of reassessing and, you know, if you start with yellow and then need to sort of slightly alter it as you, as you go along, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I know, you know, there's different, different ways that you can kind of, like yeah. we were doing in the tonal drawing, thinking about the direction of your marks and the, the shading with the color. Yeah. But I think we want to just start by giving ourselves a little bit of structure and familiarity with with the chair. So you might like to use either the yellow or a re really, really light graphite pencil to, to get a little bit of the structure of how that geometric chair works together with that softer sort of drapery of the, of the shirt. And again, you might have different objects at home that you, that you want to work with mm. that you can arrange and see up close. So this whole drawing mm. is going to go for 23 minutes. Right. So we've got a bit more time mm. to settle into it. And like with the, the gesture drawings we were doing, just um, be quite kind of exploratory in terms of the way you lay down the composition. Um, it can be quite light in terms of the, the mark that you're using. And uh, yeah, just explore all of the possibilities of the way you align the object on the paper. Mm. Yeah, I think we're going to get get started now. We'll, we'll start the timer for 23 minutes and you can all join in. Yeah, I was just getting a bit familiar with maybe a lot of the shoe drawings were on a horizontal piece of paper and now right. I've switched it vertical to better fit this chair. Interestingly, John, someone um, asked the question just before as to whether it matters if your drawings are really messy. Um, um, messy with, no, fantastic. I think <laughs> embrace it. But also, I think with a longer drawing like this one that goes for 23 minutes, you'll have that opportunity, um, you know, to sort of start off with a mess and then gradually um, over time sort of bring a little bit more definition and focus yeah. to certain areas to kind of mold it as we go through. But yeah, I think messes maybe where we get what makes drawing interesting too. Exactly.
interesting contrast too between the, the structure of the chair as opposed to the drape itself. There's a more organic kind of feel to the fold marks uh, and the fabric against yeah, yeah. The, the sharper, more geometric edge in the, the chair. Yeah, and that's something we were really drawn to in this exhibition was, you know, thinking about some of those uh, very sort of celebrated paintings from uh, later in Grace Cossington Smith's career where she was drawing, you know, in her own bedroom and you might just get the edge of a bed or yeah. a piece of fabric draped over a chair, but how she was sort of able to suggest a human presence from the interaction of that soft drapery or fabric together with the the chair where someone might have sat yeah. um, and to really sort of bring it bring it to life through her pretty groundbreaking mm. um, use of colour. You know, someone was asking as well um, whether Grace exhibited drawings during her lifetime or just exhibited paintings. I mean, I think a lot of the ones in this, in her sketchbooks were kept fairly private, but to think that even often her paintings were rejected from exhibitions because yeah. they were um, too modern or yeah. too different for their, for their time. In fact, in some ways, I think the paintings are drawings in a way, mm. in terms of the way the markers or the colour is applied. Yeah, certainly the way that she uses her, her brush um, and she has really intentional um, directional brushwork in a lot mm. of her paintings, you can sort of see it coming back to drawing. But yeah, I, I was sort of thinking what a, what a dedicated artist who said that it was kind of great that the critics ignored her for much of her life because yep. she was able to just keep following her own path and her own, um, you know, her own approach to drawing, to painting, to seeing the world yeah. without, you know, too much interference. In some cases, rejection is a wonderful kind of um, uh, career prospect because at least you then have the freedom to go mm. and work in <coughs> with your own kind of motivation rather than feeling as though you're enthralled to uh, yeah, public acclaim. Yeah, you can see she was someone who drew and painted because she, she loved it and not because she was really trying to please anyone else. Yeah. Unfortunately, art history is full of examples of where people are rejected by their generation and then subsequent generations uh, yeah, give them the recognition that they deserve. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, so I sort of, um started off with blocking mine in, well, well, not really blocking it in, just giving myself a foundation through that, that light gesture drawing. And now I'm really starting to work with the yellow, um, yep. you know, to highlight particular planes of the chair or areas of the fabric where the light is shining off. But I might also leave a few bits of the white paper itself again, showing through for the brightest highlights. Yeah, I'm still in the process of trying to uh, define, coordinate my, um, my composition. Mm. Yeah, I think my chair has got like grown a little bit, perhaps taller than the one that's in front of us, but I yes. think I'm going to go with it. Yeah.
can see someone's enjoying this drawing with the yellow. It's very forgiving. <laughs> yes, that's a lovely way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also with these extended drawings. Um, and Phil. someone else said, which is exactly what I did, that drawing in yellow is a bit hard, so they've done grey instead. I think okay. that's fine. That, that's, I also did a bit of a grey outline and then have started working with, with yellow. And then I'll, I'm going to plan to kind of go moving my way through red, a yellow, a orange, red, purple, blue, right. like in a bit... Um, wherever I see the light areas and saving smaller amounts of those darker colours for the, for the shadows. Yeah, I was also going to say that if a particular passage through your still life intrigues you, feel free to really focus in on that area rather than feel as though you have to um, give the same degree, degree of attention and detail throughout the composition. It can be quite focused and reflect your kind of response to what you're witnessing or what you're observing. You're already on to the purple, John. Um, yes. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're going a bit more back and forth. Oh, Is... oh we go back and forth, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I've just sort of finished with the yellow and I'm going to start building up some of the other colours. But um, someone's asked, that, well, they've, they've sort of remarked that they love how Grace uses colour and different types of marks. For example, lines all in one direction to build up form. Could you explain or demonstrate? some of these techniques. That's in mine, it might be still a bit hard to see because I've only done the yellow, mm. but I'm certainly having a look on the chair, which planes and uh, directions of the form that I want to emphasize. So mm. if I'm thinking about the parallel lines or marks that Grace does on the seat of the chair, I'm kind of going, going with that natural flow of the, the long edge of the, of the chair that chair. I can see. And, mm. um, even on the backrest, like I'm mm -hmm. having my lines going up and down to kind of emphasize the way that my eye flows down those long edges of the, of the chair. But You're being a bit more disciplined than- Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I look at Grace's work, yeah, it does seem like everything's very intentional. And I wouldn't yeah. say that what, I've, what I just said about, you know, following the flow of the, each individual piece of wood Mm. Is, a, is a rule because she was always adapting to what was the subject in front of her and, you know, how could she um, 
draw us, draw us into it through the direction of her marks. So mm, the, that, mm. that drawing that Deborah showed us where um, it was on the veranda and looking down towards a square of light at the end, you had um, some of the lines kind of leading you around and into the work. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes too, the way in which you apply the mark making, and particularly with the colour, um, is quite intuitive and subjective, instinctive even. Um, it's the way we, um, we make marks. It's the way our, our motor skills, our fine motor skills work. Um, and so rather than following a particular um, yeah, procedure, then I think the, you can almost give your hands license to um, pick up on a particular directional flow. Something that I, um, you know, that, that it's uh, more of a convention within drawing, like the idea of cross hatching, where you very rigorously go from lines in one direction and then to make it darker, you might put them in horizontal and then diagonal. I don't really see Grace doing that no. um, very much. Like if she's wanting to make something darker, it's more about building up the density of the lines within the same direction that they're yeah. already going. And particularly the sketchbooks reveal that there's mm. a, a mild anarchy operating when she's um, working the colours together. Mm. So we're definitely going to have um, a bit more time at the end for, for getting to some more um, questions. But at the moment, I think we're quite needing to be quite focused on drawing for these last six minutes. Six minutes. Oh I know, I, got, I spend so much time on the yellow, <laughs> now I'm going, um, you know, very, like, being less careful and really just um, trying to build up the, the tone through the layering of colours, but I'm liking how the uh, yellow is shining through from underneath, so I think it was worth spending time putting that foundation there. Right. Although it's not particularly pr practicable here, it's, it's a good idea if you have time to step right back from your drawing and just getting a perspective of the drawing and the object that you're drawing um, in alignment so that you can see how, they, uh, how your response is um, kind of connecting with what you have in front of you. Yeah, when you're very up close, you can sort of really um, get lost in the details. So yep. stepping back suddenly helps you to see it 
the you know the uh, scale, the proportion, even like the areas of light and dark with a bit more. Uh, you can, I mean, you can get the same kind of effect from kind of blurring your eyes or squinting as well, mm. um, if you're wanting to distill down. Um, like if you're getting lost looking at the wood grain or the, the uh, stitching on the shirt, then you could tr just try to remind yourself of the overall form of the light and dark. Yeah. Again, like everything, I mean, at least when I'm thinking about drawing, it's about relationships, so it's like what is this part darker than the, the neighboring area? Um, where is the darkest dark within the dark? Yeah. I also think when you're working, um, you know, at home or out in the field, then there's a possibility that you, there's a certain time frame that you work in, but then can come back to the drawing and you get a different perspective when you've given it breathing space. to forget about the, the cast shadows yes. um, on, the, on the plinth underneath the chair. It is funny how, how time goes though. I think this 23 minutes has gone quicker than some of those like when we had two minutes at the beginning, sometimes <laughs> yes. it was longer than I expected. Oh, it's hard to leave this one. I felt like it's really just just getting into um, bringing some definition to it with that that sort of addition of the the purple was so sort of powerful as a as a mm. color for adding in some shadows. You've been much more comprehensive <laughs> in your response oh, to it. Gosh. <laughs> <I'm kind of laughs> definitely focused on that one. Yeah. Trying to get there, but yeah, really loving. I mean, yellow and, and purple as complementary colours are a really great way of sort of giving that light and shade through warm and cool tones. Yeah. Yeah, and I love the, the sort of um, direction of your sketchy marks wandering around <laughs> yes. the paper and see, you know, you've got a lot more of the purple in there, um, highlighting the shadows of the yeah. cloth. I think we're probably all attracted, depending on our sensibility, towards um, a particular colour of perhaps, 
you know, those darker contrasts um, tend to uh, be the area or predominate in our response to uh, mm. the still life. Yeah. Especially yeah. kind of taking what we learned from the earlier exercises and the, the graphite tonal drawing and seeing how that really carried through, even though we're yeah. working with colour in this one. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed um, doing that exercise. You know, I can just imagine all of this energy that's been directed towards drawing um, for all of you spread out across the, mm. the country today, which is exciting to be part of. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so if we think back, you know, over the afternoon, we've started off with those um, gesture drawings, which continue to be a foundation, an important mm. starting point for all of the drawings that we did this afternoon. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's we've actually gone, gone quite well through a range of approaches, which I think are all fundamental to the way drawing can operate. Mm. Um, but yeah, certainly it's been, um, exciting. Yeah, the color in the yeah. Last and I, I can see as well, like it's really helping people to appreciate and to understand um, the skill and the sort of unique artist that, that Grace was in, in yeah. the sketchbooks that we've seen of hers as well. So I can see, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions. Well, a few questions that we'd still love to um, to get to just for the end of our session. So, yeah. What kind of pencils do you use or recommend? HB, 4B, 6B? Do we stick with one pencil or use a few at a time? I think you can, um, it depends on, uh, I don't think there's any definitive mm. uh, reason. In fact, you can actually make some really interesting drawings if you want to loosen up and make some interesting gesture drawings. Putting two or three drawing pencils together Mm. Yeah. can give you a really interesting active um, range of mark making. So um, certainly with the uh, 5, 6B, um, you're going to get a much more emphatic um, quality to the mark that you make. Um, but in other cases, your sensibility may be about, um, you know, HB or even a 3H pencil. Uh, I think it is very much dependent on mm. you know the I think always with my art making it's good to like not overwhelm yourself with too much choice you yep. know like you don't necessarily have to have the whole pen pencil tin mm. there even if I have you know the 2b um, for doing most of the sketch and then the 8b for bringing in some strong yeah. areas of contrast like those some of those are great places to start if you kind of find your own three favorite graphite pencils I, I, um, that'll give yeah. you a pretty good tonal range. I think absolutely that 2B, 3B area zone is a fantastic kind of um, uh, distillation of the kind of the mark making that you, that you can indulge in. Mm. Do you usually draw from an object or a photograph or just use your imagination? <laughs> um, I, a, bit of, a bit of everything. A bit of everything, but yeah. I mean, in my own work, which is kind of large scale landscape works, I'm often working from a photograph, but recognizing the limitations of that photograph um, and kind of going back to the experience that I've had of, of sitting there and working in my sketchbook um, and observing directly from life, even if that's not the image that ends up in the exhibition, mm. it's been a kind of important in um, creating that connection, that memory. And then when I'm looking at the photograph, which has become a bit dissatisfying and a bit flattened down, I can try to put some of the life back into it through the time I'm taking with the drawing process. Mm. I think plein air um, drawing also has a particular dynamic to it, um, which can be contributed by, you know, the natural elements that you're encountering out there. Um, in fact, there's some wonderful stories about, uh, you know, wind, rain, contributing to the response itself in terms of your experience of that location. And so, yeah, there's, there is that aspect to it, as well as the, as you say, that kind of more reflective um, process that takes place in the studio space where, mm -hmm. again, there's a different dynamic to the way you will evolve the drawing. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the field, it tends to be a much more immediate <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, kind of compulsive reaction to the, yeah. the conditions you're faced with. 
Yeah, yeah and often quite limited in time. Yeah. Exactly. All right. I think that there was just yeah, what maybe one one more question before we go, which was what other artists do you both love who are known for their drawings? Um, I think there's so many, it's, it's very hard to choose, but I, I, I love the ones that kind of push the boundaries, like thinking about William Kentridge, who keeps like working the drawing exactly. over and over again, erasing and transforming it and turning it into an animation. Um, you know, some of our First Nations artists too, like Vernon Arkey, who gives, you know, such um, beautiful way of honoring you know, family members and, and mm. ancestors through these uh, large scale kind of hatched drawings. Yeah, I, I'm overwhelmed by that question <laughs> because I think there are so many people um, whose work, um, particularly in the field, I mean, Ian Fairweather was a favourite um, for me for a while just because of the eccentricity of his approaches, um, but also that deep um, kind of connection he had with Eastern philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. But also, uh, I think there are a number of artists working in the field today that are reconnecting us with the natural, with natural elements, which I think mm. is really important. Yeah, yeah, so many to explore. And our, yeah. our collection search is a great place to start if you go um, to nga.gov.au. Um, you, you can search by a keyword. So look for sketchbooks, look for drawing. It's mm. been so wonderful to connect with you all today. Thank you for joining in, for having a go and testing your comfort zones and you know, trying some new things when it comes to, to drawing. Mm. Uh, we really appreciate uh, Sam, who's been um, providing yeah, the music yeah. for us this afternoon, yeah. and the huge uh, support from the technical team behind the scenes. So if you would like to give us some feedback, there's a very quick survey on our web page. It'll only take a couple of minutes. So we'd love to hear your thoughts and hopefully see you at another public program in the future. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Annika. <laughs> yeah. It was great. Mm -hmm.